Welcome back. In the last video, we saw how the semantics in logic represents the real world. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the syntax and how it relates to the semantics. So the first thing that a syntax gives us is a human readable representation of the real world. It tells us what things we are allowed to write down. So going back to our example from the first video, uh, an engineer might draw a diagram of a building or something they're designing. It also gives us a computational representation of the real world. And this is really important because computers are really good at shuffling symbols around efficiently and without error. So it allows us to automate some of the process and allows us to use computers to help us reason about the real world. It also gives us some precision. So it's very important in many logics to be absolutely sure that what we're saying is correct. And thoroughly and rigorously defining a syntax means that we have that precision when it comes to defining our deductive system, which is the primary mechanism we will use for reasoning about the real world. And we'll see more of that in the next video. And finally, it abstracts from the semantics. So we can write down some representation of the real world using the syntax and give it different meanings in the semantics. And this study of the different meanings of a, uh, in a semantics of a syntax is quite an interesting thing in and of itself. So first of all, we'll look at our long running example of propositional logic. So last video, we saw the semantics of propositional logic, and now we're going to see the syntax. So we want to be able to write down stuff about the real world, and we're going to call these things we're writing down propositions. And the first thing we think is, well, propositional logic is all about representing things that are either true or false. So it makes sense to be able to write down things that represent true and false. And we say these things are called constants. So what is a constant? A constant can be either the letter T or it can be the letter F. And this notation we're using is convention and it's quite widely accepted convention. So a proposition is a constant and this little bar in between the T and the F means or. And it's important, of course, to link this to the syntax. So what we're going to define over here is the syntax. And what we're defining over here is the semantics. And we're going to link the syntax with the semantics. And in this case, the case of constants, it's relatively easy. So the letter T maps to 1 in the semantics. And the letter F maps to 0. Now, you can see here that T and F are intuitive. We've designed this syntax so that T represents truthhood and false represents falsehood. But it's worth noting that these symbols alone have no inherent meaning in and of themselves. We could just as well have written something else here. We could have written Y and N, perhaps, sort of standing for yes and no. If we really wanted to, we could have drawn a little picture of a cat and a little picture of a dog. The important thing is how we relate these symbols to the semantics. So, so far, what we can write down in the syntax about the real world isn't that interesting. We can write down a T representing true and an F representing false. But we want to be able to reason about sentences like the ones we saw in the last video. Things like, it is raining, or two is bigger than five. The thing is, we want to abstract away from the difficulties of those sentences. Those sentences are defined in purely natural language, and we'd rather leave it to the linguists to analyse that aspect of those sentences. And what we note is that actually those sentences can be resolved purely down to the values we define in our semantics. One, 
and zero. And so we abstract by saying, well, a proposition can still equal a constant, the letter T or the letter F, or it can equal what we call a symbol. What's a symbol? Well, it's simply the letter P or the letter Q or the letter R. And actually there is some implicit assumption in this that there are an infinite number of these available to us. We want to be able to reason about more than just three sentences. And perhaps in reality we would continue along the alphabet, P, Q, R, S, T, or maybe we would subscript these, so P1, P2, P3. How do these relate to the syntax? Well, it's not quite as obvious as when we looked at the constants, because there isn't a constant mapping from P, Q and R to 1 and 0. The sentence, the sky is blue, which P might represent, is, is true and should map to 1. But the sentence 2 is greater than 5, under any kind of reasonable assumption, any unreasonable understanding of that sentence, will probably map to 0. And so what we do is say, well, actually, we can interpret these letters how we want, under an interpretation. So for each of these letters, we are going to map these, yes, to 1 and 0, but it's our choice which of those we map them to. And it's quite important to understand this relatively subtle distinction between the, the semantics as a whole, which defines really the, the constants and the connectives, which we will see later in the truth tables we saw last video, and the interpretation, which can change depending on what we want these letters to represent. In reality, quite often when we're dealing with logics, we're not interested in one particular interpretation. We're interested in what happens when we think about any arbitrary interpretation or all interpretations. Does a certain statement hold no matter what values of naught and one we assign to our symbols? And we'll see some examples of that in future videos, but it's worth bearing in mind for the time being. So we've expanded our syntax a bit. We can now write constants and symbols, but we want to be able to combine them together using connectives, things like and and or. And so, once again, we extend what a proposition can be. It can still be a constant, can still be a symbol, but now it can also be a thing we call a complex. And actually, you'll see various different terms and notations for these things. There isn't one standard, absolute notation for constant symbols and complex sentences. So what are we defining a complex sentence to be? Well, we're saying it can either be a proposition up here, followed by a connective and another proposition, or it can be the not symbol followed by a proposition. Perhaps unsurprisingly, what we define as the connectives are the little hat symbol representing and, the little V shape representing or, and the arrow representing impl implication. So this line here is saying, well, we can have proposition A and B, A or B, or A implies B. And lo and behold, this brings us back to the truth tables that we saw in the last video. And the truth tables in the semantics defines the meaning of these symbols in the syntax. One final thing to note is that I've just talked about A and B. But if we look at our syntax, A and B don't feature. We've got the letters P, Q and R, sure, but no A's and B's. So where do they come into play? Well, A and B were some letters we used purely to represent propositions when we were talking about the semantics. And they don't feature at all within the syntax. They're simply things we use to represent propositions. So let's take a look at an example of something we can write down with the syntax. Before we do that, it's first worth noting that the syntax here we've defined using a well-known um, and well-accepted form called Bacchus Noir form, or BNF for short, if you'd like to look it up. So here's something that we might feasibly write down. 
in our syntax. This reads, if we were to read it in English, P and Q or R. And immediately we hit a bit of a problem because this is ambiguous. This could mean P and Q or R, or it could mean P and Q or R. The real question is where are we putting the brackets? Are we putting them around the P and Q or are we putting them around the Q or R? And there are two ways uh, we deal with this. So first of all, we have an implicit order of precedence of our operators. What do we mean by this? Well, it's probably best to think about this by example. So here in our order of precedence, we find that the AND symbol has a higher order of precedence than the OR symbol. This means if we see two propositions connected by an AND, like here, then we put brackets around them in preference to two propositions connected by an OR, like we have here. So overall, this sentence, under our assumptions of precedence, maps to uh, this first example with the brackets around the P and Q. If we really wanted to write this second sentence down, then all we would do is write it as we have here, with brackets around the Q or R part. And in some syntaxes, you will see these brackets are specifically made part of the syntax. What we've done here is simply say, well, the syntax really should relate to the semantics and brackets have no semantic meaning in themselves. They're purely there for disambiguation. And so we don't include them in the syntax. Either way, brackets in the syntax or not in the syntax is perfectly fine. So what we've got here is a string of symbols, which I've written down and which in a computer, if I were to type them in, might be represented as a string. And this form of writing down syntax is known as concrete syntax. The thing is, we really want a bit of a different representation when we're storing syntax within a computer. We don't want to store syntax purely as strings, we want to store it as some kind of data structure. This makes it more efficient and easier to work with when we're automating processes of working with logic. And a representation of a sentence written in a certain syntax in a computer under a data structure we call an abstract syntax. So for instance here we see something we call an abstract syntax tree or an AST for short. This abstract syntax tree represents this sentence. So the OR is the top level operator and its two propositions are represented as subtrees. So on the one hand we have this proposition P and Q and R is its second proposition. And if we wanted to represent the second sentence with the brackets around the Q or R part of the proposition, well we can do that as well. This tree here now has AND as the top level operator with P as one of its propositions and the proposition Q or R as the second. And this kind of representation, this abstract representation, is really useful in a computer for efficiency and for automation. And now we've seen how a syntax can be used to represent things about the real world, either in a concrete syntax or as abstract syntax, and how a syntax relates to the real world via the semantics. The semantics gives meaning to these symbols we write down. We now want to be able to reason about them. And we do this using the deductive system, which is the third and final part of our logic, and which we will see in the next video.